It's so good to see you. Uh, I don't know if the sun was shining as brightly as it was first service, but I can tell you this. One of the things I love about this morning, these type of mornings in Washington State, is we really get to enjoy the beauty of God all around us. The miraculous things that he does in nature are fantastic. I was coming into the worship center this morning right before worship service, and there was, the sun was coming right through that window at just the right, the perfect ang angle, and I, I just looked up and gazed at it, and I couldn't see for like three minutes. But for those <laughs> 10, 15 seconds, right when I was looking up, I could not believe just the majesty of God in the sun. So this is what I want to encourage you today is, is don't forget to stop and just marvel at God's glory. The mountains, the trees, the streams, the lakes, the oceans that are all around us. But don't stare at the sun. Th that's something you probably should have remembered since you were a kid. I forgot just momentarily. I'm okay now. But I'll tell you what, it was a beautiful, it was almost like a laser beam coming in right through that where that back seat is. So welcome. Great to see you. I want to transition just gently into our time of giving this morning. This is our last week of our fiscal year. So if God has been stirring in your heart or putting on your heart to give something extra special today just to bring us through into the next fiscal year, I'd encourage you to do that. There's a text to give number on the screen behind me. There's also a QR code on the seat in front of you for most of you. And I wanna pray for you as you get your tithes and offerings ready. Lord, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your heart, for this church, for your people. For all that uh, we're able to do, Lord, we give you glory and thanks for that. Lord, thank you that this is a church that puts first fruits first of our time and our energy and also our finances. Lord, thank you. We give you glory for it in Jesus' name. As you do what you need to do to finish uh, creating those uh, tithes and offerings, um, if you'd like to give via check or cash, you can also do that on the way about, out. Uh, the boxes are on the side doors. But I just want to share one brief announcement with you. Today is our annual business meeting immediately following this service. So it'll be about 15 minutes to reset the sanctuary. But if you're here today and you didn't know that was going on today, this is the time of year where you as members of the church are able to review and look at the budget and either ratify it or don't ratify what the budget is being presented. So the last few weeks we've been telling you about it, making it available to you. We were asking for questions ahead of time uh, because this isn't going to be an open mic night, meaning there's not going to be a, a, a microphone right there where you can share your questions, but we've received a lot of them. So after today's business meeting, if for whatever reason your questions weren't answered, we're still going to give you the ability to reach out and we'll just contact you one-on-one -on -one to make sure all your questions are asked. We want to be very transparent. We want to be very open in what we're doing. And that's something that we're going to really take efforts towards going into next year. So right after this service, about 15 minutes after, we're going to have the business meeting. If you're a member, you'll be able to vote. If you're not a member, please still come. It's a great way to learn kind of what we do and what we're believing God for for the coming year. Uh, the, the budget sheet is available at uh, wachurch.us, budget 2024, or there will also be some printed versions for us and for you at the beginning of, or at the beginning of the meeting. All right, I'm gonna jump into this series, which I'm really excited about. Last service was really fantastic. Uh, this is week three of our series on the fourfold gospel. So we've been talking about Jesus as our savior, Jesus as our sanctifier, and today we're gonna be talking about Jesus is our healer. Let me pray. Lord, thank you for today and for your word. Lord, we take a minute to find ourselves at your feet. Lord, thank you for who you are in our lives. You're our Lord, you're our Savior, you're our sanctifier, you're our healer. And God, we believe you're our coming King. Lord, if, as we take time today to hear your word, we pray that you would bless it and use it. Lord, we need you to encourage us. We need a fresh touch today, Lord. And I pray for everyone that can hear my voice, Lord, that they would be stirred by your spirit to take a step closer to you because, Lord, this is all about you, Jesus. And we bless you today in Jesus' name. As I mentioned before, this is the third week of a four-week series. If you were with us last week, Pastor A.W. Worthington did such an amazing job, didn't he? Yeah, he was fantastic. I don't know if you've ever shared on sanctification and all the pieces of the big boulders that you have to move into place to help people understand what sanctification did and is, but he did such an amazing job um, watching Alex do what he does so well, just making it so relational, bringing theology and doctrine in front of you. One of the things that we're trying to do through this series, even though we're sharing a lot of theology, a lot of doctrine, and neither of those are bad words, I hope you know that. It's great to know what you believe. It's great to know why you believe what you do. But ultimately, what we want you to walk away from from these four weeks is to remember wholeheartedly in all these areas that it's all about Jesus. 
Jesus is our savior. Jesus is our sanctifier. Jesus is our healer. And Jesus is our coming king. Believing theology and believing doctrine isn't going to save you. It isn't going to sanctify you. It isn't going to heal you. And it doesn't change the, re- revi- the arrival of Jesus at all. It's understanding that all of these things are for Jesus and they're all about Jesus. It's the who behind all of the things. So this morning, as I step into Jesus being our healer, I want to just share with you a few thoughts that I have. And as I was preparing this, this series, I actually wrote two other messages and the Lord kept having me toss them out. And I think it was for me, something that was stretching in me possibly, but I feel he wants to do something a little bit different with us today. And this is where this message is gonna go. Uh, you may have noticed on the way in on the back two corners of the worship center, there's uh, communion stations. Uh, if you've spent any time with us, you know that the last Sunday of the month, we, we get to celebrate communion. We choose to celebrate communion together. So at the end of today's service, we're going to have a response time where you get to either stay in your seat or you can also come forward for prayer. We're going to have some folks up here ready to pray with you. And you're also going to be able to go in the back and receive communion if you'd like. Uh, That's what those are there for you. But we really want to turn this whole place into an area of response. We can respond to the Lord however he's leading our heart. But what I want to do before I say all those things any further is to begin to lay out a scriptural foundation of what we're talking about today. It's important for all of us to realize the depth of healing that Jesus talks about in Scripture, that it's consistent all the way through from Genesis to Revelation. And if you're a New Testament Christian, if you spend most of your time in the New Testament, I think that's so fantastic that you study the Word of God, that you see Jesus in the Gospels and you see Jesus in the rest of the New Testament. He's absolutely active in those areas. But we're a full gospel church, believing that the Old Testament and the New Testament are part of what we study. So if you hear some things today and are stretched a little bit today, the reason why I'm presenting them to you is because I want all of us to see the consistency of Scripture in everything that we believe. And that includes healing. That includes divine healing. There's a consistency in the Scripture that brings forward to us to challenge us, encourage us, that healing is in the Scripture. So let me read to you from Isaiah 53. I have 53.5 on the screen behind me. You certainly can read along with me on your device, but I'm going to be reading a couple verses other than 53.5. 53.3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hid their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and he's carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And here's verse 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. I love that scripture because it helps all of us realize what Jesus Christ came to do. In one hand, Jesus was there for our salvation, and we talked about that in the first week of this series. And a lot of New Testament Christians, especially Christians in the West, that's where they stop. They can grasp and get a hold of the fact that Jesus is their Savior, that through the blood of Jesus is the only way to be restored to the Father, that what he did on the cross restored that relationship in a way that nothing else could. It was only through the blood of Jesus dealing with sin, our repentance towards that gift of the cross that brought us salvation. But Jesus also in his other hand made provision for the healing of our body, not just our body, but our emotions and the things within us as well. And what I'm hoping to do today through scripture is to normalize something that really in my lifetime has become something that's caused such cynicism in the local church. I believe full heartedly that healing is for today. I believe it's scriptural. I believe it's a gift that God has released in the church. But in my lifetime, I've seen a lot of abuse. I've seen it twisted and turned away from something that it shouldn't be. And I'm hoping today that you'll step a little closer with me to the heart of what Jesus meant by bringing healing to us. That there's a normalness to it as we talk about it that's a beautiful balance between the word of God and the spirit of God. 
there's a balance in it that you and I should begin to walk out more completely in our life. There's a rhythm there that's normal for us as Christians. And as we take an aspirin, as we go see our doctor, including prayer in that moment, believing God to heal us is a balanced view of the healing testimony of God. And as we walk through this message today, I wanna be very specific about what I talk about and I'm gonna be using a lot of scripture. And the reason why I wanna do that is I feel the Lord showed me to do that today. I believe that as you see the scripture and as I read them out loud and you see the progression and the systematic approach to healing all through scriptures, that it'll encourage you, it'll stir you in a way that I don't think I could with my own words. So let's jump right into this. James 5.16 says this, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. When I read James, specifically chapter five, it stirs me to remember that when I come together in the house of God with my friends and my family, that part of what we do when we come together and observe communion is we take a minute and we pause and we reflect and we confess our sins unto the Lord. Sometimes it takes a step further where we confess our sins to each other. But the point that James was trying to get us to realize is in those moments, when we allow the Lord to touch those areas of our life that we think are hidden, that he sees, because God sees everything, that he wants to bring healing to them. He wants us to stop and reflect like scriptures teach us before we take communion and to recognize and admit if there's anything in our life that's causing a rift between him and us. And that's not to cause shame or guilt or pain or us to isolate or hide anything further. It's a provision of the Lord for us to feel free and to feel closer to his heartbeat. Your father in heaven wants you to see those things from him and in him. So as we look at these scriptures today, and I encourage you to look at them this way, I want you to see that the father in heaven designed healing in our life from the very beginning. It was a promise and a provision fulfilled through Jesus. Jack Hayford says it like this, God is good. And I could stop there. I preached on this recently. God's good. And as I lavish on you the love of God through my words, sometimes it causes a lot of people to squirm to realize how good God is and how much God does good in our life. It's who he is. As he expresses his love to you, it's because of his goodness. This is the grace of God that we're living in right now, that he's pouring out his goodness on you and on me. He cannot even be tempted to do otherwise, James 1.13. Furthermore, it is the will of God to heal and deliver the sick and the tormented. All sickness and pain are adverse to his will. As you walk out these scriptures and you begin to maybe adjust your thinking, maybe you've been in the church for a very long time, and there was a season where you believed for healing. You believed and you stood by the, the bedside of someone that you loved and you believed and you believed and you read scripture and you prayed and that person still passed away. Maybe you prayed for a child in the womb and that, that kid died. I could share testimony after testimony of those things happening. I've laid hands on the sick and they haven't recovered. I've stood in hospital rooms where people have passed away even though all the family was there and they were believers and they were praying. And we have to as a church, as Christians, admit out loud that we don't understand why everyone isn't healed. But the one thing that we need to do is respond this way, to recognize that God is still in those things. I watched the Lord heal blind eyes I've watched him watch people come off a deathbed and be healed. Uh, there was a, a woman in a wheelchair today in the first service that she's been sick for weeks and couldn't come to church. The Lord touched her last night, this morning, so she could come to church today. We have testimonies around us all the time of God's healing provision. And God also chooses sometimes to use doctors and nurses and medication. And sometimes when I stop eating candy bars and pizza for two weeks, I start feeling really super good. It's, it's what happens in our world and our life when we start to have a balanced biblical view of divine healing in our life. 
that there's sometimes when God meets us with the miraculous and we cannot explain it. I don't know if you knew this about me, but most of my life I was plagued with social anxiety. So much so that I would hide in corners and rooms and couldn't speak. I was nervous constantly and stressed out to a level where I, I looked maybe a little bit crazy. I had such social anxiety that the fact that I'm even standing up in front of you today is a miracle of God. And now I'm not against counselors and I'm not against medication. I'm not against any of those plans. But for me, this was a miraculous thing that changed in my life instantaneously. It was divine healing to the point where I can share the truth of God's word in front of you. I could not have done this before Jesus. That's my mom giving the testimony right there. She knows. That's who I was. And so I stand before you today not knocking anything else that you're thinking or feeling or processing through. We all have a story that's immense. And if anyone's ever told you that your story isn't huge, they're lying to you. All of us carry our past, our present, and our future in us. And as we process through this thing today, looking at scripture, this is my encouragement to you, that your story matters and where you are right now with your walk with Christ matters. And part of this word may stretch you because it's hard to wrap our head around. Sometimes it's easier to believe in the natural than the supernatural. But we're not normal. God has not called us to think normally. What he's doing in your world, the fact that you believe he saved you and brought you unto himself is the greatest miracle that any of us will ever receive from him. But at the same time, when we look at scriptures today, you will see my prayer is at the same time he offers you healing, divine healing that's unexplainable. He wants cancer to be gone. He wants anger to be gone. He wants lust to be gone. He wants broken marriages to be healed. He wants wayward children to come back to the kingdom. He wants depression, depression to be gone. He wants to heal gluten intolerance. He does. And that's no shame on anyone. It's what he wants to do. Will he do that today? I don't know. Am I willing to step out and say, Lord, heal us today? Absolutely. All of us, I pray today, will be stirred to another level to believe in his healing in our life. Because I can't exist in this world without him showing up daily. I can't exist in this world if I have to maintain a a weight that I can't carry on my own. And part of the healing that Jesus offers is in his atonement is to take the weight of all those things off of me and off of you. Scripture teaches us that he was bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace was on him. It's something we can't carry. We can't bear the weight of that. But he already did. Let me read this for you. A.B. Simpson says this. He said this. Faith must rest on the divine word. Your faith, my faith, It has to rest on the divine word of God. That's the foundation. That's the root system that we stand on because of our understanding of God's word in our life. The most important element in the prayer of faith is a full and firm persuasion that the healing of disease by simple faith in God is beyond question a part of the gospel and a doctrine of the scriptures. When you and I grasp this, past our cynicism, past what the world maybe has shown us, and to grasp and see that is the will of God for us to be healed. That it is a normal part of Christian life to be healed and to be set free. Just as much as our salvation is, so is healing. In just a little while, we're gonna remember what Jesus did on the cross through communion. And for most people, it's easy for them to grab a hold of the shed blood when we drink the cup. But the broken body, the broken bread is us remembering the full worth of the cross. That Christ died not only to save us, 
but to also heal us and free us of the things that we can't get free on our own. It would, be, it would take too, entirely too long to examine in detail the countless records of his healing power and grace. It just would. I would be here all day sharing all these things with you. How he cured the leper, the lame, the blind, the palsy, the impotent, the fever stricken. All that had need of healing. This was Jesus' ministry. When we dig into the gospels and we look at the epistles, this is who Jesus was. How he linked sickness so often with sin and he forgave before he spoke the restoring word. In Jesus' time, so many connected sin with sickness that in order to prove his authority, he also healed the sick and the lame. We know theologically that's not true. Not all sickness is associated with sin. However, some is. And when we come together, just like James says, and we confess our sins, sometimes an instant fruit of that confession is the healing of our body, the freeing of our mind, the ability to no longer do the things that we're doing because we've been delivered and freed. Don't let the word deliverance freak you out. It doesn't mean that there's a devil that's gonna run out of you or something bizarre is gonna happen. There's a freedom and a deliverance that comes because of what Christ does in our life. And sometimes it's incredibly gentle. That's how I got free. I don't even know what I was praying for, but there was such a freedom that came over me. And that's how I live my life. There's an ease about it because that's who Jesus is. All authority in heaven and on earth was given to Jesus. And he's released that into you and to me. It is our God-given legacy and right to walk out these truths in freedom and in power. And it doesn't mean that you're gonna be hard to deal with. In fact, you're gonna be someone that brings life. You're gonna bring life because of what Christ is doing in you and through you. Recently, I was given the book to read the Gospel of Healing by A.B. Simpson, and I really have enjoyed it immensely. I've spent the last two weeks reading into it. If you're looking for a really good read, um, it'll challenge you. It was written in the early 1900s when, when things maybe weren't known about divine healing that we talk about today. And I wanna present just some scriptures to you. I wanna read out loud some scriptures to you. The slide's on the screen behind me if you wanna take a picture of it. I'd encourage it to be your devotion over the next few weeks to look at all the way from Exodus all the way through scripture, that there's a consistent portrayal of healing that is about the church and us as Christians. Starting all the way back in Exodus, this is the earliest promise of healing that's written in the scriptures. Let me read it to you. Exodus 26. If you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in his eyes, if you pay attention to his commands and keep all of his decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Psalm 105:37 says this, he brought out Israel laden with silver and gold and from among their tribes, no one faltered. One transliteration says this, not one feeble person was among their tribes. I like Psalm 105 because it'd be really easy to look at this and think that the Israelites were doing everything that they were supposed to do, that they were listening and obeying. But as you look through scriptures, they were not listening and obeying. But God still poured out his promise to heal in Psalm 105. And that's an encouragement to me. In weeks maybe that I'm not living up to what I know that I should do, God's promises just don't evaporate. Can I remind you again what we talked about at the beginning, that God's good, that he's not a God in heaven, that there's this massive chasm between us and him, just waiting to throw lightning bolts down on you and me when we make a mistake. We live in the age of grace, and it's a beautiful thing. There's time that God gives us to turn and repent to him. And I would challenge you if you're in this place today and you have not turned to the Lord, this is that time. This is that time to receive the fullness of God to receive your salvation, to receive your healing, to let him free you. But we don't live in a time when God's wrath is poured out on us. It's just not scripturally accurate. It's just not true. I look at 1 Corinthians 10, 11, 
And it says this, these things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. Scriptures teach us that all these things that we study from the old into the new were written down for us as a warning, as a caution, but also as an encouragement of what God will do, that God keeps his promises. And as I mentioned earlier, Jesus is the promised Messiah. And that Messiah that came brings freedom, salvation, healing. Like we've been talking about for three weeks now, Jesus is our salvation. Jesus is our sanctification, that growing in the Lord. And Jesus is our healer. Psalms 103, 2 and 3 says this, Praise the Lord, my soul, and forgive, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all of your diseases. Jesus is standing in front of me, you and me, offering those things to us. Salvation and healing and freedom are only through Jesus. And I don't know about you, but when I walk around Woodenville even, Seattle, and I travel, this world desperately needs those two things. They need freedom, they need forgiveness, they need healing and deliverance. And the cross of Christ gives both those things. Isaiah 53, 4 and 5, I just shared. Matthew 8, 16 and 17, great verse. I pray that you read it. John 14, 12 says this. When evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him. And he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and he bore our diseases. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. That's what Jesus said. Mark 16, 15, 18 says this. He said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved and whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name, they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deep, po deadly poison, it will not harm them. They will place their hands on sick people and they will get well. And I know I already lost some of you when I said snakes and poison. I get it. <laughs> I get it. We've seen a lot in our lifetime. But don't let the things you don't understand about Scripture make you blind about the things that you see are so true. And the more we look at the consistency of Scripture, we as God's children are called to lay hands on the sick and they will recover. What Jesus did on the cross was enough for our salvation and for our healing. It's what we remember every time we take communion. And as we're stirred up today to see Scripture the way Scripture is, I pray that another level of that remembrance will happen to you today, that what he did on the cross was enough for you and for me. 1 Corinthians 12, 9 through 30, talking about spiritual gifts. I believe the spiritual gifts are still active and present in the church today. It's a great study if you haven't dug into it. I'm gonna read verse nine to you this morning. To another faith, this is talking about the spiritual gifts that were released to the church. To another faith by the same spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one spirit. When the Lord releases the gift of faith and the gift of healing into a church, there's such a balance that you'll express, be expressed and such a balance people will see. Not everyone has the same gift. Not everyone has released that same gift. But in a New Testament church, when those gifts are released, there's a stirring that happens. And it always points back to Jesus. It always gives glory back to God. But there's something about the room where the atmosphere is different because it isn't a faith that's stirred up from within us. It's a, a faith that's poured out on us. And that's the spiritual gift of God. That's the healing of God when it comes into a room. It's not mustered by someone. It's not stirred up by someone. It's not because someone prayed for a really long time or fasted for a really long time. It's a gift released to the church to bring glory to Jesus ultimately. That's why healing comes into the church is to bring glory to Jesus. 
James 5.14 says this, is there anyone among you sick? Let them call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. The symbol that we're looking at today for this series is, is the, a vessel that held the oil of the Holy Spirit. One of the primary um, symbols of the Holy Spirit and the scriptures the poured out oil upon us brings healing to every area of our life. So it's a symbol that we use when we pray for people, when we anoint people with oil. It's a symbol of a recognition of the Holy Spirit moving in our life to bring healing and freedom in us. Third John 2 says this, Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you even as your soul is getting along well. What a beautiful thing for someone to say to us. What a beautiful thing for the apostle John to speak into our lives that we get to read today. That we may enjoy good health and that things may go well for us. Even when the sun isn't shining, even when you're struggling and having a hard week, that doesn't mean things aren't going well for you and for me. There's a balance and a rhythm that comes into our life because of the scriptures, because of understanding what God is doing in our life. Romans 8, 11 says this, and the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. I've shared this before, but can you imagine for a minute with me that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, the same spirit that holds the stars in the sky, the same spirit that caused the sun to shine and the sun to set, lives inside you and lives inside me. He who raised from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Is there anyone in this room that stands on that scripture when they're having a hard week? That he will actually quicken your mortal body? That he'll actually bring strength and vitality into your mortal body? That's a promise and a prayer that we can pray according to Romans. And Hebrews 11, or Hebrews 13, 8 is the last word, scripture that I want to share with you in this part of the message. And the reason why I'm sharing it with you today, because it's easy to think that maybe this stuff happened in the past. And there's many scriptures we can talk about that today to maybe clarify that for you. But this is one particular one that I want to give you, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Amen. Jesus sent out the 12... Jesus sent out the 70 with the direct purpose to go and win the lost, to lay hands on the sick and watch them to recover, to, to deliver those that are demon-possessed. And all throughout the New Testament, we see that this was what was being released into the local church. And for a couple centuries now, it's been lost in some denominations and some churches. But there is a mandate from God when we go out to win the lost when we point people to Jesus, that signs and wonders will follow us, that people will be freed and set freed, that those that are sick will become well. It's part of what scripture teaches us. Now I wanna go somewhere with you this morning. I wanna share with you four things that I think have consumed Christians. And I wanna give them to you today in hopes that it'll change maybe the direction that you're feeling in your heart about scripture and the way that you look at scripture, particularly when it comes to divine healing. I think these are lies from the enemy and they're embraced by so many. So here's the first one, the power that comes to us, the power that heals us, the divine healing that I'm talking about today. It's not from our own faith. I can't fast for two weeks and do all the right things and read all the right books and all of a sudden have this faith that's gonna heal me. My faith responds to the work of God the stirring inside me, the faith I have sometimes is released, just like I was sharing that 1 Corinthians 9 gift that's released to the church, the gift of faith, the gift of healing. But it's not my faith that brings healing. I can't heal myself with my own faith. I don't have the power or the authority or the divinity to step into that realm. But many, and you'll read this over and over again on the internet, so many blogs, that our faith is what heals us. Our faith is a response to the releasing of the anointing of God around us and in us. But our faith by itself does not heal. That's theology and doctrine, the faith that we have. We exercise our faith towards these gifts, but our faith isn't what heals us. 
The second thing that I want to point out, it's not from within us. We can't eat a beautiful diet and fast for 40 days and then all of a sudden somehow align the peace within us where we're going to be healed. Is something going to happen naturally if you detoxify yourself and you start exercising well and you start having a really great diet? Absolutely. There's a natural thing that's going to happen in our body because our bodies were designed to heal themselves. That's not the healing I'm talking about. We can't do all the right things enough to bring healing into our life. We don't have the power. We don't have the authority. When I studied the New Age movement and things in my life before I came to Christ, the thing that would always stop me and those things that I pursued was it turned around, eventually I would have the power and the authority to do the things that I was supposed to do. And we see this rampant in the world today. We see this rampant and teaches even in the church that you somehow can get to the place where you have the power and the authority to change these things in your life. That's absolutely scripturally inaccurate. You cannot do that unto yourself. The power that comes on us for healing is not from faith healers. You're not gonna run to someone that somehow has some type of ability and power to bring healing in your life. Once again, the first Corinthians nine gifts are not what I'm talking about here. Jesus did release the gift of healing and the gift of faith among many others into the local church. But faith healing is new age terminology. Faith healing is found in all kinds of world religions. It's associated with so many people, a faith healer that can lay hands on you and have you recover. I remember being in India on a mission trip and I was traveling in a train with faith healers and I was there with my friend and we were doing the exact same thing in India. But the difference between us and them was the power that we had came through Jesus. And we would watch them have an inability to heal the sick because the power of God was there. I'm pleading with you today, if you have a, a mentality that you think you can go to someone and get healed, it's only to Jesus that we can go to. It's only through the power of the cross that we can find healing. All other teachings are anti-Christ teachings. And I'm not trying to scare you or cause anything to be stirred up in you that, that the Lord doesn't want to break you free from. But we have to line up with the scripture. Just like A.B. Simpson said, we have to, beyond a shadow of a doubt, know what the scripture teaches about divine healing. And that's not through faith healing. Faith healing and divine healing, there's a chasm between the two. And we have to know that they're different. And the final thing that I want to share with you Divine healing does not come from an object or a ritual. You can't do the right thing on a Tuesday of the third Sunday of the month on a special holiday when the moon is in a solstice and find your healing. You cannot consult the stars or wear a crystal around your neck or bow to some incense laden deity on a throne and receive your healing. If you're receiving healing from that, it's not divine healing and it's a ploy of the enemy. I wanna free you today from what this world has taught us that this, there's a plurality of truth. There isn't. If you're believing God for biblical divine healing, it will not be found in ritual and it will not be found in some other deity. Jesus is the way, the truth and the life for our salvation and for our healing. In every area of your life, it's only through Jesus. It's a lie of the enemy to believe any other way, that you have some power and authority on your own or from something other than Jesus to find that freedom. It's a lie, and I pray the Lord just removes that from your mind today, frees you from that thinking. Jesus is the only way. Isaiah 53, 5 says this. Hear it a little bit differently now as I say it out loud. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace and with his wounds were healed. What Christ did on the cross was the fulfillment of the promise of God all the way through scripture. What Jesus did in his earthly ministry was a fulfillment of what the Father sent him to do, to seek out and save the lost, to destroy the works of the devil, and to heal the sick and free those that are demon-possessed. And I know that's hard to hear because we don't want to be a people that maybe is frowned on by the world. 
this doesn't have to be a weird thing that you do. It doesn't. Because if you're trying to muster up anything other than allowing the Lord to work through you, I would caution you to pause. There's an ease in stepping out into what the Lord wants us to do. There's an ease in telling your story. There's an ease in winning the lost. There's an ease in laying hands on the sick and them recovering because it has nothing to do with you at all. Would you receive that freedom today? So many of us try to have all the answers and all the stories. But if we could learn to just point people to Jesus, the Spirit of God will do all the rest. When we're open and available and allow the Lord to talk and move through us and point people to Jesus to lift him up, he literally draws all people into himself. There's an ease in it that I want us to walk into. And there's a normal ne- normalness to it. There's a normality to it. It's common. It's what the church is called to do. But we've kind of gone to sleep a little bit in these areas. So how should we respond? There's a lot of ways we can respond today. There's a lot of things that we can do. But this, as always, is my encouragement to you. I do not want you to respond because I'm twisting your arm or causing some emotional stirring inside you. That would completely defeat the purpose. But I am making space for the spirit of God to stir us up. And I am making a space for you and I to respond to what he wants to do today. And by making that space, I believe it's a more real expression of him moving in his church. So as the Lord begins to stir you, there's a couple things that I want to have you do today. One is when you're ready, you can go into the back corners and, and receive communion. There's not going to be anyone there serving today, but we, we serve an open communion here in this church, meaning if you've asked Jesus Christ into your heart and have made him your Lord and Savior, you can partake in communion with us. If your children are with you, which I don't think they are because they're all at uh, Children's Church today, which is fantastic. But if your children, child is here with you today, we just ask that you use discernment. If they're ready, awesome. There's also going to be some folks up here to pray with you. Now, let me remind you of something I just said. These aren't faith healers, okay? They're here to agree with you because you're responding to the Lord. They're here to pray with you because you're choosing to respond. So in just a minute, when I have the worship team come up here, we're gonna turn this whole place into uh, just a, a place to respond. And if you don't wanna move, if you wanna stay in your seat, I would encourage you in this, just like I do every Sunday, stay in your seat, but don't let your heart close. God can touch you right now on your way home, tomorrow at work, when you're commuting midweek. God's ready to move in your life whenever you allow him to. But you gotta let him. You gotta keep your heart open and allow him to. So let me read this to you. This is us responding to the Lord in our heart. And you can use these words or any ones that you choose. Whatever brings you glory, Lord, I believe you can heal me. With the absence of a firm word to the contrary, then I believe that you will. But the only reason I want to be healed is because I want to bring you glory. If something else brings you more glory, that's okay with me. It's not about me. It's all about you, Jesus. And if we can keep our posture looking at Jesus regardless of what we go through life. And I know this is difficult. And I've shared my story about my friend Nick to you many times. Full heart transplant at 35, kidneys replaced. God given him 38 more years in his life. He takes 24 pills every day. And we meet every week. He's one of my best friends. He's in his 70s. And we talk about the Lord. Some, some days he's in a wheelchair. Some days he's walking. Some days he can't speak very well. Some days he doesn't want to put the camera on himself but he's walking out the reality of God healing him through doctors and through the miraculous. 38 years, I don't know if you know this, is very, very unusual for a full heart transplant patient. He has over 50% more of his life because of that healing. And I'm sharing this with you today is because God wants to do something in you that's real. He does. And it might be through the miraculous divine healing today of something you've been carrying in your body, in your mind, in your soul. Maybe it's something you've been carrying since you were a little kid that no one ever knows, has known about. By him being bruised on the cross and carrying your peace, it's for that thing inside you. 
This morning, the, the prayer team that was in the back shared a couple things, and I want to close with this. They really felt that the Lord was showing them that there's a mistrust that God wants to heal, that there's marriages in this room that God wants to heal. There's emotional wounding and an identity that's a little bit broken that he wants to bring back together. And they shared the scripture reference of Psalm 20, that God hears the cries of distress and he responds. I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna ask the worship team to come up and I'm gonna pray for us this morning. And this is how I'm gonna pray. I'm gonna remind us once again of what Jesus said to his disciples. On the night that he was betrayed, he took the cup and passed it to his disciples. And he said, remember me when you drink this cup. At the same time, he broke the bread and he gave it to his disciples and he said, remember me. In the remembrance today of taking communion, it's for the salvation that we can't get anywhere else, but it's also for the divine healing that isn't available to us anywhere else. When you remember today, take time before you go up to align yourself with the full worth of the cross, to allow the Lord to move in both of those areas. Kiernan and the team is gonna lead us in some more worship. I'm gonna come up after a little while and close us with a benediction. But until then, let this place be a response. Whether you come forward, just go back and share communion, or just have a time with the Lord at your chair. Let's let all, all that today just be unto the Lord for Jesus' glory. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word and for your truth. Jesus, thank you for the provision of healing on the cross. Lord, thank you for the clarity in scripture that healing is consistent in our inheritance. Lord, we receive the full worth of the cross today. Thank you for forgiving our sins. Thank you for healing our soul and our body. Jesus, we pray that you would receive glory from today, from the testimonies and the fruit from today. And we bless you in Jesus' name.